start off with the demo actually so i'll just show you guys what i built and i'll tell you why this is such a cool thing right and and uh, this whole application was built within 13 hours like a single session 13 hour session i was able to build the whole thing this is a data processing pipeline which basically takes data from a csv and uh, does some matching and some api calls for each record and then posts uh, posts the data uh, into a redis stream and then you know this is so that other processes that depend on this data can pick up the data off of those redis streams so that's the whole idea so now the application is up uh, and this is the dashboard. Both of them are the same application. On the right hand side, you see the dashboard in, uh, on which you can see the uh, pipelines. And this is just a control center kind of situation. All right. Uh, so now I have started up the pipelines. OK, let me make sure that both pipelines are started off. OK. OK, so yeah, as you can see, uh, there are two pipelines that are running simultaneously. And wait, let me make that full screen. Is it still visible? It is, yeah. All right. So uh, basically, the first pipeline is the ingester pipeline that takes the CSV record, converts it into, a, into the format of a Redis message, and then just uh, passes it on to uh, the matcher. I mean, it just pushes it as, into the Redis stream. And there is a second pipeline which picks up jobs from the Redis stream. Like whenever there is a message on that stream, the second job pulls it out of the Redis stream and processes it, uh, like add, uh, enriches the data through. Uh, an API call to Wikipedia, which is a demo thing. So it does all that and basically posts it back into another Redis stream, right? So right now, uh, the data that we are processing is movie records, right? So the, it's, uh, it's uh, what do you call that? Mm, the, the movie uh, title, the, there's a CSV with the movie title. Wait, I can show you that actually. So if I open this, this, mm, so. CSV looks like this, right? You have the movie data that's coming in, then you have the rating of the movie, and you have all the genre. And basically, the API call takes the first genre out of all these genres and then gets the information about this from a Wikipedia page and enriches the Redis stream. So if I do go to Redis CLI, I think, yep. Now if I do X length on not look at the key, not EX. F. Uh, pipeline dot x matcher.ex. Yeah, genre matching summary, right? Now, uh, this is also a summarization of the data that's happening. So I'll just show you guys a summary, right? So if you look at it, x, um, no, no, h get all. There you go. So as you can see now, uh, the data has been fetched, but we also were trying to simulate the or uh, simulate or emulate. I get confused between the two, but yeah, uh, we were trying to like recreate the situation where uh, where you know you ha we have to summarize the data, and this kind of shows you that right. We have already processed three hundred and sixty-two thousand comedy movies, two hundred and sixty-nine thousand dramas, uh, and so on, right? So we have all this uh, data that is being processed by the pipeline and is constantly being pushed to this uh, stream. Right, as you can see, the numbers are also changing. If you look at the crime, it's at 9:30 now, and then if you add one, it's like uh, okay, now it's not crime anymore. Yeah, 94 crime is at 94 right now. So it is constantly being pushed in batches. And if you look at it, we have the uh, we have the first one is the producer, which is like the data source. Then you have all these processors which are uh, which are which are working for towards uh, categorizing the data and pu pushing it into a batcher. And then these two processes are batches being pushed into the registry. So this is the uh, application, right? And the whole thing, right? The whole thing, including the UI, the whole uh, logic behind ingestion, API call, the API client, all of this was implemented in 13 hours. And that is why I, I think Elixir is, uh, that is where Elixir really shines, right? So you can really prototype fast data processing pipelines and really parallel processes, including things like uh, use cases like machine learning. You can use something like Elixir for that, right? So yeah, uh, now let's actually get into the presentation. But do, do you, I mean, uh, was this clear? Do you guys have any uh, questions about the application itself? Right, I will take that as a no. OK. All right, OK, now we will talk about. Sridhar. Oh, what's up, Sudhakar?
Hey, I think everyone is dumbstruck by what you're showing. That's why they're like, oh, they're still you know, recovering from the shock, so you have to do some time. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, no, this was just a demo, but I will uh, go into the details of what exactly is the tech stack that I used and how these things played a role in creating the whole application, right? So I think that yeah. will make a lot yeah, of sense also, to it. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, did you do the walkthrough of these batches and all the you know, plans of the grouping? The, the, uh, you did not show the code yet, right? The Elixir code. Uh, no, I did not show the Elixir code because right now okay. showing the Elixir code doesn't yeah, I will not uh, help. Okay. But yeah, after I show finish off all these concepts, I think we can talk about awesome. the code itself a little better. All right. OK, uh, so were you saying something, Sudhakar? That's it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, OK, cool. OK, uh, so to get started, right? OK, when I say OK, Google just decides that I'm going to say OK, Google next. <laughs> All right. So uh, Elixir, right? Elixir is a language that basically is very synonymous with Erlang. And Erlang is a language that came out back in the 1970s, I believe, which was uh, used for telecommunication or a telecom service software, right? It was it was geared towards writing telecom service software. And, uh, you know, it has all the properties that make our, uh, what do you say, telecommunication systems rely uh, so reliable today. The, the, the Erlang... Uh, what do you call it? infrastructure is what makes it possible to have such a stable and uh, um, a highly available telecom system right even whatsapp uses erlang internally so it, it yeah it's it's really good for parallel processing and also making sure that when things fail there is always a good recovery strategy right so uh, let's go with some basic terminology right so there are a few things when you go to the Elixir uh, homepage or the or the or Elixir application, uh, Elixir language uh, documentation, you'll come across a few terms like Elixir, Erlang, ERTS, OTP, and Beam, right? So initially, I was totally confused as to what all of these things were, but I got to know. I mean, I I, I looked into it, and then I got to know that Elixir and Erlang are synonymous. They they are both languages that compile down to the same byte code. Right, so which means like uh, how we have uh, Clojure uh, and Java itself, right? They both run on JVM, and both Clojure and Java uh, compile down to uh, what do you say the JVM bytecode at the end of the day. Similarly, Elixir and Erlang both compile down to a bytecode called uh, Beam bytecode, and Beam is basically uh, the virtual machine on which uh, you can run the Erlang bytecode, right? And uh, you have something, yeah, OTP. OTP is basically uh, a set of Erlang libraries uh, that, that were written in order to create a system to run all your applications, right? So it includes things like behaviors, things like uh, uh, certain, um, um, so certain libraries that are required to run your application in a certain way. So these are runtime dependencies that you have. All that is contained in OTP. These are basically Erlang libraries, right? And then the Beam, like I mentioned, is just basically Bodgen's Erlang abstract machine, which is a virtual machine uh, on which Erlang runs. It's a hybrid uh, register and uh, stack machine. It's, it's not uh, exclusively a stack machine or a register machine. Um, yeah, ba uh, basically, uh, that's, I mean, that's OTP and Beam. And then you have something called uh, the ERTS, right? ERTS is basically, like I mentioned, uh, Erlang runtime system, which is, uh, which is uh, what do you say? Which is created, provided to us through the OTP, uh, OTP libraries. So they they create the uh, Erlang runtime system, and the Beam machine is also a part of the Erlang runtime system. So some of the things that we talk about when we talk about Erlang is it is fault tolerant, right? And uh, I'll 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 mention what they mean by fault tolerance in a second. But yeah, it is a fault tolerant system that we have. I mean, we can build fault tolerant systems using Erlang. Uh, it's highly concurrent, and it is also distributed. So scaling is not going to be a big issue because uh, that's the way the beam itself is designed, right? So when we say fault tolerant, so when you, when we talk about Elixir and Erlang, we have this strategy, not strategy, it's more like a, a concept called let it fail, right? So computer systems and you know software systems tend to fail, and failure is something that you cannot really avoid. But then Elixir and Erlang, both of them provide you a 
better way to deal with failures a better way to decide what the uh, what the error domain is how how much of the system should be affected by a failure right uh, it does it through many things like uh, you have you have uh, what do you say supervision strategies where you have supervisors that are constantly looking at processes and and when a process fails it will restart the process it's a whole thing right so we, we have a bunch of uh, configurations and and tools that are available within erlang and elixir that will help you handle those failures in a in a better way right and and when we talk about supervisors in a bit i will i will uh, talk more about this fault tolerance part and then concurrent right so when we talk about concurrent not not concurrent see when i say concurrent basically i'm talking about parallelism here so parallelism in uh, languages like rust go c and all these languages they basically depend on operating system threads right uh, for uh, running processes parallelly so the thing about operating system thread is it is still heavy right it is still a, a heavy uh, abstraction but when it comes to erlang we have this concept of like the vm uh, the vm has a concept of a process which is basically similar to a thread but the way it works is so the beam when when you spin up an instance of a beam virtual machine it will it will uh, create it will have a scheduler for every core in your machine so every core every processor core in your system will have a scheduler and all the processes that are triggered by you all the processes that you create are basically pulled in by uh, all these schedulers all these different schedulers uh, uh, on the on the beam virtual machine and when you add more machines to it right so you have a way to actually add more machines to the same beam or same beam instance so all the all the cores on those computers are also treated as just just another core that's similar to the one that's already in your computer so this offers an enormous uh, advantage when it comes to scalability you can just add more and more machines without using things like uh, um what is that thing yeah k8 kubernetes right yeah you don't need to use things like kubernetes because you have a language level support for uh, doing all those things and there is even a daemon called the erlang port mapper daemon which i'll show you a demo uh, at the end towards the end of this so this basically takes care of the communication between uh, the machines that are connected over the network so the erlang port mapper daemon it runs on port number 6379 i believe whenever you start a bm uh, sorry a vm beam vm it will automatic so anytime you add a node to that um, that main system it will automatically assign an ip to it it will automatically do all the authentication and things like that so yeah that is epmd all right any questions so far i know that's like a lot of concepts being thrown at people and most of you might not have understood things so i'm happy to talk about anything that may have not been uh, clear All right. Wait, did everybody really understand that? Okay. Wait, I'm, I'm... Can you repeat from the first again? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, that's what it felt like the first time I was so learning about the, 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 no, no, So my, my only concern is, for example, EPMD, uh, the thing. So they don't play very well with uh, Docker uh, instances. The, I mean, so I, I actually found um, uh, like Elixir's way of process management and scaling is incompatible with Kubernetes's way of uh, dealing with uh, uh, this thing. Uh, because uh, as far as Kubernetes is concerned, uh, it, it only thinks about, say, uh, okay, these are like ephemeral instances. So you start as a container and that process is kind of isolated in the container and you can throw it away and do whatever. Elixir kind of works the same way. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, the uh, so, uh, for example, you need a whole bunch of ports for EPMD to work, and they all need to be forwarded to all these ports, and they all need to be able to to discover each other, and service discovery happens that way, and so on and so forth. So there there are a lot of assumptions on how uh, you know kind of Beam works actually. So that's the that's what I found, uh, and they are in, they were created in a different kind of an era where. Uh, you know, you had data centers and you controlled your machines and like they were all in a smaller subnet and they were not like geographically distributed and so on and so forth. True, true. I mean, I, I agree with you on that. And uh, actually, I even tried setting up with, with uh, setting it up with Docker. I did face a lot of issues, but I have a Raspberry Pi which was running uh, somewhere, and, and it worked flawlessly with the Raspberry Pi. So yeah, I, I understand like what you're saying. So this Raspberry Pi is literally running Elixir right now. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, but, yeah, that. Huh. 
No, uh, but uh, Barmi, so uh, like, you know, why should we bring this into the space of Kubernetes? Meaning, yeah, I understand we cannot, but I'm saying that this is a closed system in a way, right? It has this fault tolerance, this no, territory. It also so, you can you can you you can scale horizontally with this by just attaching more machines to it. It's more like a so, complete system of its own, right? Correct. So, so the, the the trouble actually becomes when say for example you have uh, uh, so uh, imagine you have all these other workloads that are running which are on Kubernetes. Okay. Now they have their own VPN uh, or uh, or their own sort of like a network that is happening. And they have their subject mass, and that's how they are doing service discovery and uh, DNS resolution and all those kind of things. Now, Elixir is just one of those pieces, say, in, in this particular case, SIP, right? I mean, you want to do. And then mm -hmm. it uh, it needs to, say, reach out to some other API endpoints. Now, uh, traditionally, if, it's, I mean, if you are already on a Kubernetes infrastructure, you can actually set up uh, things like, you know, network policies, port security policies, uh, you know, and all those kind of things and to make sure that. Uh, this particular process has access to uh, uh, th those services that it needs to, you know, talk with and so on and so forth. But now you are creating two different islands. Now they can't talk with each other unless you externally route them, and you have two different like private networks: one for your uh, er Erlang Beam VM based cluster, which is running on its own VM, say, and then you also have your other thing that is running. It's definitely possible. You can wire all these things through. But from an operational standpoint, um, I mean, if you are already committed towards containerization and Kubernetes and all that, which most uh, organizations are of that scale that would need Elixir, uh, I mean, that that DevOps roadmap is also kind of incompatible with Elixir. Or yeah. So maybe. so most uh, yeah. So most interaction between those services will have to happen through an API. They are they will be isolated in terms of you know uh, the the infrastructure. They will be isolated. No, even I mean that... even if it is so, even if it is through an API. Um, mm -hmm. So the, the the problem, uh, say for example, you you have your Beam VM and uh, and your uh, Elixir machine and it, it it's actually running Tomboy. Is it uh, the the uh, what's the what's the web server that runs? Tomboy. Uh, uh, yeah, Tom. Yeah, it's Cowboy, not Tomboy. Cowboy, Cowboy. cowboy sorry, Tomboy. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Tomcat and Cowboy kind of like, yeah, Cowboy. So it runs Cowboy and then it, it, it does whatever it needs to do, right? But but the, but the point is now uh, that say has to I mean that Elixir process has to say access some microservice which is doing authentication, say authentication and authorization. Now if mm -hmm. it needs to do that. Uh, it needs I mean, the authentication or authorization service should basically say, okay, this service is allowed to access this thing, right? I mean, this needs to come from this IP. Now, mm -hmm. if you're in a Kubernetes infrastructure or an AWS kind of infrastructure, so on an AWS, you generally do like security groups and all those kind of things, and you allow this to be to access it, right? And that's on the VM level. But if right. you are down at the, um, uh, what do you say, the, the Kubernetes level, then you do set up pod security policies and you also set up network policies and say, okay, this pod can access this or this namespace can access, access this, right? It kind of assumes that all workloads are uh, running there. You can always open up an external port, in which case you have to set up an ingress controller to get those things. Uh, uh, typically, okay. I mean, like it, it kind of breaks the Kubernetes service model at that point in time, right? Or even if AWS does it, ECS it kind of breaks that AWS ECS service model. And you actually need a, a sort of like a, 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 a API gateway in front to do that, mm -hmm. right? Which which is the English uh, L7 routing that comes inside. So True. I'm saying the, the, uh, it's possible you can do that, but it kind of like breaks the the assumptions and the model of how modern DevOps is done versus. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I, I mean, it's not. I'm not saying this is better or worse. It's just, I'm just saying that. They are incompatible. I actually happen to like Elixir's way of doing this uh, because Elixir kind of thinks of all of them as processes, and as long as they are running on the Beam VM, as you said, Shudaka, you can scale it out horizontally. The only problem becomes that it's not, anything that is not running on the Beam VM can essentially not participate in this scaling solution. Correct. Correct. Actually, so, uh, actually, uh, the, go ahead, Shudaka. Sorry. Sorry. No. One thing, Barney. So I'm just thinking, right? Assume that you have a pod. Right, mm -hmm. and uh, inside that pod, uh, assume uh, no Erlang VM runs, and right. uh, we can give a lot of resources to that pod, like a lot of CPUs. Maybe that no, that is actually it can be configured in such a way that it will take the whole 
work out. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. You can actually set up yeah. continuity policies for the pod to make sure that you are basically yeah, running this on a uh, on its own set of nodes. Yeah. But yeah, but the thing way, is, it's now everything. Yeah, go ahead, sit down. No, no, the, the thing is, uh, it's more about the port mapping, right? Because EPMD, configuring EPMD to, you'll have to make sure that, you know, every time you spin up a Beam VM, it is configured to run on. Uh, so the, every, every to, for two beams to interact, you need two ports open. Like one is the signaling port to let, uh, so signaling port has to be the same, right? Across yeah. the thing, it has to be the same. But what port you actually run the uh, beam on, that can be different, right? So when it comes to all these ports, uh, ma mapping and things like that, it can get really tedious in terms of the DevOps thing. And there are libraries that kind of solve this for you, like lib cluster and all that. But yeah, like, like uh, Wagmi mentioned, it is kind of, it goes against the normal containerization uh, rules and the way normal containers are expected to work. Yeah. Yeah, no, so that, uh, just to ask you, I mean, why don't you, I mean, so you were saying, yes, you can set up affinity there. Yeah, so my, you, the idea is, right, assume that you give a pod big enough so that that's like a black box from the perspective of Kubernetes, right? Okay. And assume that you wanted to start more pods, if we configure mm -hmm. in such a way that you create more pods dynamically based on the load. And uh, like what Sridhar is saying, right? If the port mappings are done properly, maybe at Helm chart level or some other level, addition of new pods will make it seamless for the whole uh, Erlang machine to scale horizontally. But uh, Kubernetes still manages the resources at a much higher level, at a pod level, right? No, so uh, essentially every Erlang process is one pod, and you can only have one Erlang process in a in yeah. a host, you can basically run only one that one pod on the host. Yeah, one Erlang process. Okay, then if it creates it, no, it creates a lot more processes, right? Barney? No, 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 no. Those, that, are, those no. are green processes. Yes, those yeah, are not operating system process. I mean, they create uh, they create operating system processes, but what the process that Elixir refers to is an internal abstra abstraction of, uh, you know, which the, is the, the which is much text. better, right? Then. I mean, which makes it much more easier at a pod level to manage, right? Barmi? No, it, it, there is no, it, it, that will be completely invisible to the pod. You, you don't yeah. know, I mean. It's okay. I mean, is yeah, problem? I mean, I'm not saying the problem essentially becomes, say, for example, now you want to set up a horizontal pod orchestrator, right? So you want to say, OK, uh -huh. this thing comes up. I want to provision new things to uh, take care of that. Now, if you set up a horizontal yeah, say pod say CPU reaches 80 percentage. Yeah, yeah. Or, or oh. you write your own custom HPA and you say, okay, I want to auto scale this based on this thing. Now, essentially, you have to pair up that horizontal pod auto scaler with the uh, what is the infrastructure scaler underneath. So, for every every pod that you want to start, you essentially have to provision a new machine. That is the same with any process, right? My point no, is, no, no, I, no. it still it is not. You can easily abstract out their line. It is not. It is not right, right. because uh, because you need to maintain a separate cluster for uh, beam processes. So that cluster cannot be mixed with others. So it's, a, it's, it's similar to running a machine learning workload now. So essentially, you're still yeah. using the same commodity hardware. But say, for example, if you're running machine learning workloads and you want to do horizontal pod auto scaling on the machine learning workload, then you need to spin up new GPU instances, correct? And add that to the. Right, dude. No, my point is that is what I'm saying. You have things and the affinity, you can set that so that nothing else gets scheduled to that worker node. No, I'm not saying it is not technically possible. It is technically possible. Okay. But okay. They, it doesn't, I mean, the, the way in which Erlang scales and manages it is, mm -hmm. uh, is, is kind of, I mean, they were they are product of two different thought processes and two different areas, right? So at I that agree, point right. in time, uh, you had all these beam processes, and they beam VM was all you needed, right? As long as you could yes. uh, run your workloads on the beam VM, anything that's on the beam VM, then it's very easy to scale, communicate across processes, all those kind of things. Now, yeah. once you start scaling this out, so and then you want to do EPMD, and then you want to like oh have one Elixir process talks to another Elixir process across these kind of boundaries, then it becomes I mean, it, it's just that uh, as a as a uh, what is a computing organization, I think we we have grown beyond the uh, assumption and abstractions of uh, you know 1960, 70, okay, 80. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. uh, the the, the right. thing is, you yeah the, the these two the what do you say Kubernetes and uh, our Beam VM they are totally I mean the way they function are like 
two different, uh, totally different concepts, right? But you can kind of have abstractions between them. It's just a little more difficult to do. And I think people are working on libraries, like libcluster is one of them I saw. And I, I you know, I, I, I recommend checking that out, libcluster. It, it, it kind of creates, uh, it, it does the, what do you call that? The orchestration of nodes for you. Right. Yeah, but still, yeah, uh, I, I agree with uh, what Vagme mentioned. It is difficult. It's not a, it's not something that you can easily achieve. So you have, you have to have significant knowledge of both B and uh, DevOps, right? Yes. Kind of, uh, yeah, that's the that's the challenge there. Yeah. That is true. That is true. But but you know what? This is like mostly managed for you. And then honestly, I, my DevOps knowledge is not exactly the best. So I I was able to understand a lot more, even without that DevOps uh, uh, perspective of things. I, I think it's a little more. It's lot. It's a lot more simpler than a typical Kubernetes setup. Say says the guy who runs Linux. <laughs> But, but, but yeah, I mean, Arch Linux is like a desktop system. I'm very good with, right? But servers are. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so yeah, uh, and and the last two portions of uh, this uh, this uh, definition section, right? It's just Erlang and Elixir. As you can see, they're both literally the same definition. They're both functional. They're both concurrent. They uh, they are general purpose programming languages uh, that compile to the Beam bytecode. Beam, like you know, we've been talking about as the machine on which uh, Erlang and Elixir run on. OK, so uh, now I, I'd like to talk about some more abstractions that are introduced by uh, the Beam, right? And and how that kind of plays into the whole process, uh, a whole uh, process of building data pipelines and how you can really do things parallelly, right? OK, so we'll talk about three abstractions. One is processes, nodes, and the other is supervisors, right? Okay. Processes are basically, like Wagme already mentioned, these are green processes in the sense that they are not operating system processes. And uh, processes on Beam are really lightweight. And I think by default, you can spin up to 256,000 uh, processes. You can you can even upgrade this limit. And typically, in a production system with a lot of cores, you typically find anywhere between like a million to 5 million processes. You can run those many at the same time, depending on the number of cores that you have. Uh, they are um, they are lightweight and they are concurrent and it is it, it, because because they, we have a scheduler per core all these processes that you spin up are automatically uh, distributed across the cores so uh, that's one thing I really wanted to show you guys I forgot to show you guys so when I start the pipelines once again right as you can see uh, I'll just do this and I'll do H top right so no G top that's what I wanted. And uh, so if you look at it, I have 16 cores on my computer right now. And all the cores are at full usage, like close to 100% usage, as you can see, right? So the minute I kill the process, I mean, this is also this can also be attributed to the fact that I'm actually using my uh, OBS thing and also the video uh, call right now. But if I kill the process, you can see what I'm talking about, right? Let me just kill that quickly. Uh, PK. Uh, wait, what's it called? Mix, VHX. That's the one. Now I'm just going to have to attach Tmux once again and kill it manually. Yes. And if I do this, as you can see, the processes, one, now that I've killed the uh, thing, you, as you can see, the, all the process I mean, is starting to fall. So whatever processes that were happening in, in, in the data consumption or data ingestion, that was utilizing all the CPU cores, as you can see. And now, as soon as I stopped it, it just like dropped immediately so this is kind of the proof as to i mean a proof to the fact that it is it does run on on, on all cores of your computer just saying uh all right Let's that's this again yep cool okay so uh those are uh, uh, you know beam processes they they are they're kind of similar to ruby processes but ruby processes because of the global interpreter lock and the way it handles concurrencies through context switching it doesn't really Run parallelly, truly parallelly, uh, unless it's an I/O or uh, you know some non-CPU uh, intensive process. Ruby works, but yeah, now uh, Elixir works in a totally different way, and that's how it does. Okay, now we'll talk about uh, Beam nodes, right? So, like Wagmi was mentioning, nodes are basically multiple instances of the Beam VM, 
right? These two instances can literally be on your same physical machine, right? You don't even have to think about virtualization or anything. Let's say you have you're starting up two beam machines on your system, right? Just like how you start a Ruby interpreter or your Rails uh, uh, process, you can start two of them. They will also be treated as two nodes. You can have the second node running on a different machine, right? Like I have on my uh, Raspberry Pi, uh, I have it running on a totally different machine, right? So if you look at this, R Pi zero W. It's, uh, it's running on a totally different machine, but this is a nerves project. So it's a whole different thing. I'll talk about it in a minute. Yeah, I can literally say IEX mix, and then I can give it a name of, uh, let's say, node one, right? At uh, 192.168.50.206. That's my uh, IP address uh, for th this specific machine. And then I can set a cookie, uh, and I'm going to call the cookie Shridev. That's like the password for your uh, for connecting to this node right so i'm gonna i've set the cookie to shridev okay and let's say i also what did i do now oh i don't need mix here okay uh, so now now I have a um, node running here. Now this is on my other dev box. This is Sridev at dev box which is my uh, Raspberry Pi. Um, uh, then I will start up another node on my local, which is Sridev at dev station. That is my current machine from which I'm talking to you all. So uh, I can do IEX um, name. Um, uh, what is it? Oh, yeah, node 2 at 192.168.0. No, no, not 0. 50. 153, right? That's my uh, machine, and then cookie will be three wave. And okay, now if I say node dot connect, and I go back to the first machine, right? And then I'll just connect the, the copy the name of this node, right? And then I can uh, connect to that node one on my first machine, right? Uh, with me being stupid, one second. Uh, so node dot connect. Mm. Node one at one nine. Just gonna copy that again. Okay, so from the node two, this is the Sridev dev station machine again. So from node two, I'm connecting to node one, and it's it has returned true, right? Now if I say uh, I'll go to my other machine, right? This is dev box machine, which is my Raspberry Pi. If I do node dot list over here, as you can see, my node two is visible from my node one. So now they're both connected, right? So I can basically spawn tasks, right? I can say spawn like this, and I can pass in a function, anonymous function, and uh, I I basically will process it. I'm not going to do it now, but I'm just going to show you like ping, right? If I say node dot ping. Uh, and then I pass in this first node, right? Uh, I mean, the second node. Uh, it's basically going to ping that node and return Pong from the other node, right? So you can spawn processes, you can spawn links, which are basically like processes, but that are con that continue to remain connected or remain uh, to have a communication channel open between the two. But yeah, basically, you can have all these things out of the box on the Beam virtual machine. You don't, this is what we were talking about, right? We don't need Kubernetes or anything like that for Beam. So yeah, uh, any questions about this? I just have a common question, I think. Uh, yes. No, which is lighter, Go routine Erlang or Golang processors? A Golang processes are uh, their go routines are similar to like C's core routines, which are kind of uh, so which is which are like the operating system process sub processor or child processes, right? Uh, so they are heavier in nature, and uh, Erlang no. uh, compared to the, compared to that Erlang processes are much more lighter. I think go routines are not uh, OS threads. Okay, they? no, they're not. They're just processors. No, yeah. So no, I I I think go routines may be lighter. The reason is that. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, like Go routines, Erlang processes have a stack that is associated with them. Uh, mm -hmm. You also have these kind of like preemptive scheduling for uh, you know Go routines, uh, but then uh, you don't have uh, a, a message box associated with uh, every single uh, Go routine there. I mean, you uh, the, the mailbox is only associated with certain uh, sort of like uh, I mean, you have channels. And they're synchronized, but it's 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 not a it's not for every process. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm able to Thank see you. like goroutines are. Yeah. Goroutines are more like OS threads, and Erlang processes are more like OS processes. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. Maybe goroutines are actually. Yeah, goroutines are maybe like like yeah. I mean, my 
Golang thing is. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, maybe, but I, I've not really looked into that difference. But yeah, probably. All right. Uh, Interesting to explore that. Yeah. I actually thought about it, right? but I I didn't know because you know the number of Go routines that you can spin up are limited to the threads that are available to each core on your processor. I believe is am I am no. I, I mean correct me if I'm wrong. No, no, it's all just no. you know, it is only by limited by memory as far as I know. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, I should probably explore that a little more. I mean, <laughs> at a given point in time, yes, of course, you can execute only so many uh, threads uh, mm -hmm. based on the CPUs that you have, but you mm -hmm. can create unlimited because of the preemptive nature, right? I mean, every process will get some fixed amount of time, and then it will mm -hmm. be put back into the queue, right? similar queue. to what Erlang does. So you mm -hmm. can basically create a lot. And uh, Go routine is non-blocking, meaning Go routine has to give its control voluntarily. It can actually hog, one process can hog. But Erlang is amazing in that way that it will preemptively kick it out, saying that you have you have only say fixed amount of time for every process, it will kick yeah. out after that. So the starvation cannot happen in Erlang processes, but Go routine can starve other processes out. Oh, okay, okay. That is interesting. Actually, I believe, right, uh, go, uh, Erlang is not just about the parallelism, but the things like, uh, you know, the, the uh, let it fail concept and, you know, how failures are handled elegantly and all these, all these together with the parallelism is what makes it a tool of choice for companies like Discord. You know, they, they started using uh, Elixir with uh, Rust recently. And they they were able to scale from three million users to now eleven million active concurrent users at this point, I believe. Wow. Eleven million, yeah, eleven million users. So this is what, right? The failure handling and 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 the way the processes are uh, can be easily scaled. Not processes. The uh, additional instances of VM can beam can easily be added to the existing VM uh, beam VM node. Is what makes it. Uh, a, a tool of choice, yeah. And I, I know when we talk about the supervisors, I'll, I'll I'll tell you what kind of supervision I'm talking about. But yeah, uh, cool. Uh, I think yeah, we, uh, we have like 15 more minutes, but I'll make it like really fast. <laughs> Wait, but that uh, does that answer your question, Sudhakar? Yeah, sure. All right. All right. Okay. Uh, okay, now moving on to uh, okay. By the way, lib cluster is a library that lets you, like I mentioned, the thing I just showed you now, where you you can connect multiple nodes. That is automated for you, and all the processes that you spin are automatically distributed uh, in a random way. Uh, no, sorry, in a round robin way uh, to all those nodes. So that's what lib cluster does, and it's a it's a, it's a great library. You guys can check it out if you're ever going to start over with Elixir. OK, and the last concept within the beam is the supervisor that I'm going to talk about. So supervision is basically like, you know, when you spin up, let's say, 1,000 processes, and you have uh, these processes doing different things, right? And let's say uh, if a process fails, what do you do? In any other uh, system, normally, you would just raise an error and probably halt the pro halt the main process that has called this process or something of that sort right but in elixir and i'm not sure if other languages have a similar concept but in elixir you have this concept of supervisors right and these supervisors what they do is supervisors are responsible for spinning up uh, other processes and if any of those processes fail and these supervisors are constantly uh, doing health checks on these uh, children nodes right and supervisors will basically go okay this failed right this node failed so what is the next thing i need to do so you can specify some default available supervision strategy like one for one one for all rest for one and no, just rest for one, and the other one is like a custom supervision strategy. But basically, if you have a supervision strategy that has been mentioned before, it will know how to deal with a failure, right? So let's say I have a one for one supervision strategy. Now, supervisor has five different children or five different child nodes. One of them fail, the supervisor will only restart that same node with the last known working state, right? So that is uh, that is one for one strategy. One for all strategies. Out of these five nodes, even if one node fails, all the other nodes will be restarted because you know that might uh, you, if if let's say your one process depends on the state of all the other processes, uh, you you can restart all the all the nodes even if one fail. Rest for one is basically let's say you have five processes one two three four five. Let's say if three fails. 
three, four, and five will be restarted. If four fails, only four and five will be restarted. So one for rest, right? So whichever process fails, whatever is remaining, like whatever the processes are remaining in that uh, supervisor's children, all those processes alone will be restarted. And you can structure your processes in the children list in such a way that you know you can uh, you can may, uh, may take advantage of this this uh, supervision strategy. And then the last thing is a dynamic supervisor, which is basically so normally in in static supervisors. The, the 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 compiled code needs to be aware of all the processes at compile time. I mean, at, at the beginning of the uh, runtime, right? So in the beginning, all the processes are spawned, and that's how it just continues to live forever, right? But let's say you want dynamic supervision. Like, uh, let's say a user comes in, logs in, and as soon as the user logs in, you want to start up a process as long for the for the period duration of time the user is logged in. Let's say you're continuously collecting some sort of data from the user or doing something only for that user, right? You can use something like a dynamic supervisor. Which will which can dynamically load uh, children processes and dynamically kill them. So that's that's an uh, that, that's what I've used here. So if you look at this application, when I click on start pipelines, it's basically starting these two pipeline processes, which in turn are starting all these processes that are part of the pipeline. And if any one fails, there are different supervision strategies that come into play here, and the dynamic supervisor will take care of how the failures needs to be handled and things like that. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm quickly going to go through the rest. I think we'll we'll go through more questions at the end. Okay, so uh, Gen Server. Gen Server is one of the behavioral patterns that is implemented uh, as a part of the ERTS Erlang Runtime System, right? So Gen Server is like a server client behavior of your code, right? So Erlang is normally uh, both Erlang and Elixir. They are normally functional programming languages, meaning they need to be 100% point free. You should not be able to store state, right? You should not have any state, and any function that you write should not be able to modify a state that is not local to the function, right? So when you have things like these, you cannot really because see, functional programming is a great. Uh, way to think about programs, but ultimately you write codes for the side effects. You want to make uh, a database call. So database is a state. Literally, it's a state, right? So uh, you want to be able to interact with the real world. So in those situations, that is when Elixir and Erlang, they blur the lines between an object-oriented language and, an, and a functional language, right? So Gen Server is a good example of uh, why Elixir is not a 100% uh, functional programming language. So Gen Server is like, it will it will let you have spin up two different uh, it will spend, uh, let you spin up a server process and from any other thread that you have running or any other process that you have running you can make calls to this main process that is running or main thread that is running and it will modify the server will maintain a state which is trapped inside this process and whenever you make a call to this process through the you know the actor model system that we have uh, it will kind of modify its state right it will it's technically not mutating anything. It's technically replacing the existing variable with the new new state. But to from the perspective of a process that is outside this main server process, it looks like you know you're modifying the state. If that makes sense. I know this is a little weird, but yeah, if that makes sense to everybody, I can yeah, I can go into some example. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is an example of a gen server, right? So let's say I am creating a gen server called uh, to-do list, right? And uh, we have a start link method. So start link is a function that is called by the uh, uh, process that is out that wants to start a gen server, right? So when it starts up, you basically call to-do list dot start link, right? And you pass in the options, which in turn will call the gen server start link, which in turn calls the init function, which is like a server side callback for the start link function which gives you an initial state, which is an empty list over here, right? Then I'm creating a handle call function, which is called by any client. And they can add an item to this list, OK? So I'm just creating a, a callback that has this uh, atom called add. Atom is the base. The atom is basically symbols in uh, Ruby. They're called atoms in, in Elixir. So you have the add atom that is being added, I mean, that is being passed in as the first uh, first portion of this tuple. And then you pass in an item. So basically, all this handle call does is it takes the existing state that is handled or that is trapped inside this server process and it will add the item to that state uh, uh, to that state the state here is basically the list it will add that uh, item to the list so this way i have built like a to do list technically it can't 
it technically counts the list. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, so uh, the the reason the reason I say that is because uh, it, it doesn't add it to the end. It added. Add, I mean, add additionally. Yeah, it doesn't. Mean, so, kind of. It's right, right. Up. Right, because it is faster to add it to the front of the list so you can if you if you if you're basically appending uh, to the list you do something like this which is much slower because the lists in in elixir are linked lists so it's easier to add to the beginning than to add to the end because you'll have to follow through the whole link and reach yeah. the end yep i agree uh yeah so so as you can see right this is even though it's even though this is like a functional language it um it kind of bends the rules, right? Does that make sense? So for React developers, can we think of init like use state and then handle call like where it actually does whatever the set state thing? Yes, this is very similar to that, yeah. Like think of this like a component and think of the state as the React state that you have and then all the calls modify the state and that's literally what this is. But the problem is it kind of bends the rules of functional program. You're not supposed to have something like this. You're not supposed to be able to mutate something in functional programming. Like literally all variables are immutable here. You can never mutate a variable. You can only create a new variable and set it to the, or new object and set it to the old variable, right? So that's technically what is happening here. But because it is behind this gen server module, it's from, from to the outside world, it looks like, you know, it's modifying the state. So essentially, yeah. every handle call has to return a new state, and that mm -hmm. is what gets overwritten. As, as I mean, essentially, it is a new variable at that point in time, or, or a new value, right? Yes. So every handle yes. call has to return. No, uh, can, can, can handle call not? Uh, yeah. Handle call always has to return state. Uh, no, it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to return state. So see, uh, so in Gen Server, you can have something called handle call and handle cast, right? Handle yeah. call is when you don't care about the return value, and handle cast is when you actually want a return value, right? So yeah. handle call. So, but since you are consing the list list here, and then you have uh, this thing, would mm -hmm. would it get added to the list? I mean, I, I'm wondering. Yeah, so the return value of the handle call will be passed into the next time you call the handle call function. Okay. It will be passed okay. into the state. Right, 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 right. Yes, so that's kind of how it works. And it internally, there's something called a process registry, uh, which, you know, if you have enough time about it, I'll talk about MNG and ETS, which is Erlang term storage. So it kind of stores all these things in the Erlang term storage, which is, again, against the concept of functional programming, right? You you don't even have a monad or any, or any functor here to actually hide those things, right? It's it clearly is like, okay, I've given up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, cool. And one more thing that has come out of this gen server process, uh, gen server model is the gen stage, right? Gen stage was not part of the core library of Elixir, but now I think it is being added as a 1.12. I believe uh, gen stage is a core part of the uh, Erlang runtime system, right? So gen stage is similar to a gen server, but uh, the funny thing about, uh, not funny thing, the interesting thing about gen stage is that it's a, uh, so it's like you have all these processes that are that have different functions right you have a producer you have a producer consumer and you have a consumer right so you can have these functions th these processes do certain things to the data in a particular order right and it can behave like a data pipeline right it gives you things like um uh, what do you it, it gives you things like the ability to uh append multiple uh, processes or multiple gen stage processes into uh, into a pipeline. Like for example, let's say I have a pipeline that takes a CSV data, puts it in the DB. Let's say I want to add another process that will basically modify the CSV data. Let's say it removes all the sensitive information and then pushes it to the DB, right? So it makes it easier to add a producer consumer in between this uh, pipeline that already exists and to scale or extend it, right? So it, the, the gen stage is, is built for things like that. And uh, basically, like I mentioned, producers are data sources, consumers are data sinks, and producer consumers are data transformers. Or this is a word that I totally came up with. Yeah, but basically they are data transformers. Any questions about gen stage? I'm kind of rushing through because I think we have only five minutes. Yeah, so one thing that I found, I think Junko uh, had one repo which was already using Elixir, YouTube report processing where they were using Flow. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I don't know if you had a chance to look at that. No, that I haven't had. So okay. they already have one, so which is using this. So they are, uh, I mean, 
it started off with something i think now it's in a, some stage i fixed a few, a few bugs on it and i mm-hmm. what i found was it was very difficult to debug flow um this thing i mean yes i mean like for example if you have a series of like um what is it the, the data transformations that are happening where you essentially are uh, i mean you you have this the, the transducing operator right with the pipe and the gradient and symbol that we, yes. we use uh, mm-hmm. i mean it, it it if you are if that if you have a problem with that and you have to debug it with flow uh, at least the way it was it was it was really really hard actually so no it is horrible up, even now oh it's horrible even now okay so yeah. what i ended up doing was i actually always you know kind of yeah use instead of uh, this thing from uh, i mean i turn those to enum you know make make it work with that uh you know deal with all these issues because i mean the the logic may not change but they say the file that the structure of the file that you used to get used to change and mm. it, it used to break in in between and since they were all running in uh, in parallel you didn't even know uh, which section got broken which which failed and so on and so forth okay okay so uh, yeah i mean it is still the same thing right now i tried using flow and flow is meant for things let's say you're doing something like uh, solving an advent of code problem right their flow is pretty good right but if you mm-hmm. want to use it in a production system i would recommend i mean i would highly recommend against it i would say do not use things like flow for production systems that's this this is really a, a library that's meant for very very simple use cases right if you really so that's where the same company the the dashbit company that came up with the uh, fi uh, flow they also mm-hmm. came up with broadway because they are clearly understood the flow is horrible right so they came up with broadway and broadway is what i used here also okay. so broadway I, is a i didn't know broadway yeah maybe we should you should do a talk on broadway I'd be really interested to find out what this is. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the whole whole pipeline is built on Broadway here. The pipeline that I built, right? The mm-hmm. Redis stream uh, generator. Mm-hmm. These are all custom generators. And mm-hmm. uh, yeah, basically, I, I I could possibly talk about this, but yeah, it's like its own. Uh, in in one of these messages, can you can you do an IE expiry and then like get in in case something? Because that was one other thing. Totally. Uh, one thing with flow was that i it, it broke right. ies right actually so which made it less than useless to find out what was going on actually yeah 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 i i totally understand what you're talking about but uh, with broadway you can do that i'll tell you why right so i'm just going to start up mix phx or server right now literally the server the machine i mean the thread on which the server is running i have a repl within that server right okay so all the processes that are spun up by this uh, by these uh, what do you say by these by this main process is available to me through this point and you cannot use iex pry here you will have to rely on prince extensively right okay. Uh, okay you will have to because when you enter a different process you are no, you are still in this main the context of the main process you can only interact with those processes through functions so you right. will have to heavily rely on print statements and i think that's the case i mean with sidekick it's not that difficult but here it is it it is difficult yeah. but you know yeah that's, that, that's... that that was one thing that kind of like broke the the I mean, because, uh, it, much like ruby right i mean in elixir you depend a lot on iex to kind of like you know build these things because these expressions that you have i mean you you kind of organically build them because you you can like you know transduce those values through these function parameters and so on and so forth and it yeah. makes it very difficult to just build it you know off the top of your head so that i i mean if if you cannot do uh, like i ex pry in the middle of this it becomes very very difficult you know I, i you can do it it's just that i think you'll have to do something like remote pry or something i you know i'll, I'll, I'll uh, actually yeah. post an article about this I, i i read about it actually when i was trying to debug this broadway pipeline that i built i was trying okay. to do some debugging because it would crash for no apparent reason right yeah. oh by the way that is not the issue i don't think i'll get to that part here it's almost done but yeah uh, there's there's one something so there's something called a native implemented function right which is basically mm-hmm. like uh, ffis and ruby and right? mm-hmm. uh, so you can call that is how even this people right discord people have done it right mm-hmm. but uh, the thing is if you try to run a function that is going to die within a nif that is in a different process inside beam right does it mm-hmm. make sense so far it will yeah. bring down the whole beam wow yes that's nice <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, I mean there are people who are working around solu- working on solutions around this, but it's ideally not recommended that we uh, you, you write unsafe code in Rust and try to use it as a NIF, right? It'll essentially bring the whole beam down. So yeah, that is another big. Uh, so uh, so you have, have you written NIFs with Rust? Yeah, I have actually. Once I did, just to learn. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. Yeah, it, it, and, and I, that's when I got to know about this thing, right? I was like, shit, the whole beam is, uh, it'll just kill the beam process, that's it. Okay, that's that's cool. I mean, uh, I I'm just, I was just looking at Rustler. Uh, it's pretty interesting. Rustler. Yeah, Rustler is what I used as well for this. Okay, okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, okay, so you basically, okay, last two things before I want, I mean, before I let you guys go, I know we are already a minute uh, over. So Amnesia and ETS are two things that are available within the Beam machine. So Amnesia is uh, basically a full-fledged relational database management system, right? And which is available through across all the nodes. It's a distributed DBMS that is available within the virtual machine, right? So that is there. And then you have ETS, which is like a Redis alternative that is also available within the virtual machine. Erlang term storage is basically an in-memory uh, store for mm-hmm. stuff, right? If you want to maintain state. And these are two other reasons why Erlang is not, Erlang and Elixir are not functional programming languages. Because maintaining state is done all over the place. If you look at the process registry, that is also mutable, right? So it is done all over the place. But like Wagmi mentioned yesterday on Discord, it is functional enough to get things done. Yeah, that that's that's essentially what this is. Yeah, a a uh, purely functional language which doesn't even support monads so would only make the box very hot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cool. So basically, uh, yeah, this is guys. I think I, I've I've held you here for. A, I mean, I've held you hostage here for a while now. I'm done. I will not talk about the mix and things like that. It's just a build tool like bundler. And yeah, these are some of the things I didn't talk about. I'll make sure this org file is available to you. It's like a markdown file. It's available to you all. Uh, yes, that's that's uh, that's it, yeah. guys. Thank you so much for joining. Yeah. Mix is not like bundler. Mix is more like line engine. Correct, correct. It's more like line engine for closure, right? Yeah. 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 Yes. 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 Bundler doesn't it, even come close. Come close. No. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It, it's more like bundler plus rake plus all the things that we use in Rails plus some static file generators also. No, the, I, I, I think uh, there are tools like Mix, Line Engine, and say Cargo are in a in a separate category versus yes. say NPM and uh, Bundler. So NPM and Bundler are kind of the same. Same, uh, yeah. right? And then and, and Go Go mod Go's dependency management the mod system is also similar to I would say uh, the like just pure package management, right? They they, yeah, they like see right? what they want to do. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, not like see. Uh, I mean, like there's package management, and then there is this uh, project management. I think mix, uh, line engine, and uh, uh, what is it? The, the cargo and all that are, are in the project management space. While mm-hmm. uh, and I would say even to a certain extent, Gradle is also in the project management space. Yep, actually. Uh, but yep. say um, a bundler and. Uh, uh, say go module system and all that is is, is kind of in the, uh, in the in the package management space. I mean, the, the, the yes. tools are slightly different. Maybe we can have yeah. another talk on different like <laughs> yeah yeah totally. package management. <laughs> yeah yeah. The thing is, uh, I mean, I just wanted to wanted all of you all to know that you know mm-hmm. why Elixir is uh, Elixir can do certain things that other languages has you know certainly won't do it as effectively as Elixir does. Not everything, but certain things, right? So yeah, so that if we have any projects in future where you really need parallelism and you know very highly available systems, yeah, yeah. give Elixir a try. <laughs> and yeah. the Jose Valin guy, he's a very, very sweet guy. So if you even if you want to, because it's not like a, it, it's it's open source. Like you can literally, yeah. I wanted to contribute a, a file. So there, the file system you have is like a file stream system that you have, which is basically like a file pointer. Right. Uh, it, it, it there is a better one in Erlang, so I wrote a wrapper around it for uh, Elixir. Right. So mm-hmm. if you want to contribute, they've they've been like very positive, and they're not they're not like uh, you know they're definitely not like Linus stalwarts. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, there, there's a very good community around Elixir. I love the guy. Same. Okay. So, but platform tech has shut down, right? And now it's it's platform tech. Band. Yeah, I think they're called Dashbit is the one now, right? Dashbit. Okay. Dashbit. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Dashbit is what they've converted oh, they into. 
Okay. Yeah, Jose Valim. Yeah. No, it's not. Okay, one thing. Sorry, I mean, this is not like a correction. But yeah, you know, in Brazil, apparently, I got it wrong and somebody corrected me. So in Brazil, you don't say half or ja. So it's literally Jose oh. Valim. Yeah. It's Jose Valim. Okay. Good. Yeah, yeah. I, or, yeah, uh, only Portuguese in and other... Spanish. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yes. they speak Portuguese. 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 Okay. Yeah, it's, so it's good like ja in yeah, in, just just saying right because I got corrected uh, and then I thought okay. I don't know, it's good. Enough, it's good yeah, cool. Yep. So yeah, we have like four people who are like really at the core of it: Jose Valim, uh, Marlis Saraiva, and uh, there are two other guys. The the guy who created uh, uh, the Phoenix framework and and mm-hmm. also I forgot his name. And there's also one guy that uh, wrote Sasha Urik. Sasha Urik is the guy who wrote the book Elixir in Action. So these yeah. guys are like at the core of the system. They're really great guys. Nice. Yep, yep. Uh, so yeah, this is the state of Elixir right now. <laughs> nice.